to call this meeting to order. Welcome. We're in the Olin TNG High School Library tonight. Um, we're going to do things a little bit differently so we can recognize um, some of our students for academic and extracurricular achievement. But we need to get the meeting started first. So, Mrs. Hatfield, can you please call the roll? Mr. King? Present. Mrs. Patrick? Here. Mr. O'Brien? Here. Mrs. Wagner Fiesel? Here. And Dr. Weiss? Here. Please Thank say, you. please stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I don't see any changes to tonight's agenda, so can I have an approval on tonight's agenda? Do you have a motion? Oh, Mrs. Patrick, do you have a second? Second. Uh, Mrs. Wise, uh, any other discussion? Call the roll, please. Mrs. Patrick? Yes. Dr. Wise? Yes. Mr. King? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. And Mrs. Wagner Fiesel? Yes. Thank uh, you. Dave King and I are going to go down to the theater with Mr. Ray, and we're going to go recognize some students, and we will be right back. Well, not right back, but back as soon as we're done. <laughs> Oh, and we're going to show the recognition on the website.
Okay, good evening, everybody. As I, uh, this is a special night, obviously, for all of us. And uh, we on the board like to recognize the students, the staff members for the outstanding achievements in co-curricular, extracurricular, and athletic activities. This evening. And as I announce your name, please walk to the stage to receive your award and have your photo taken with Board President Julie Wagner Fiesel and Superintendent Mark Rafe. And these photos will be delivered to you via your individual schools in a few weeks. So we'll begin with academics. Earlier this school year, we had the honor of celebrating our district's national merit semifinalists from all four district high schools. And we are proud to announce that each of these semifinalists obtained the rank of national merit finalists. <clears throat> we will begin our ceremony by honoring those students in 2021 national merit finalists from Owen Tangy Schools. So from Owen Tangy High School, and again, I sincerely apologize if my pronunciation is not really good. I have practiced it, so I'll do my best I can. Kam Kamachi Oshnu. Here we go. I'm, I'm ready. Didn't do that very well. Akash Nav Ari. Did we miss her? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Ishu Sani. Colin Somerville. And Abigail Swani Dos. Okay, from Olentangy Berlin High School. David Cotina. And Madison Lapid. Yusuf Rashidi. Bennett Twafna. Okay. And absentia is uh, Sydney Webb. So from Olin Tangi Liberty High School, Reem Ahmed. Alexander Chen. And Samuel Ding. Uh, Ryan Joseph. Sarth Sarthik Mohanty. Sydney Roll. Shara Sak Amori. Oh, didn't do that well. Sorry. In absentia is Sindhu Sharma. Catherine Sullenberger.
Sonia Thompson. Dorian Tricaudi. Curtis G. <clears throat> Kathy Zhu. From Olentangy Orange High School, Iman Hurley. Pranav Krishnan. Yash Patel. Carter Pudella. Kali Tu. And again, congratulations to all of our National Merit finalists. So for athletics, we now turn to recognize our phenomenal student athletes. Many students have received individual state level honors and their support this year. The board congratulates the following students. From Olentangy High School, Kylie Aniki, 2020, OCC Division Player of the Year, Girls Soccer. Cameron Corrigier, 2021 State Champion Girls Swimming, 100 Yard Butterfly. Martini Peroni. 2021 state champion girls swimming 200 yard individual medley. <laughs> Sophie Sparks, 2020 OCC player of the year, year girls volleyball. <laughs> From Olentangy Berlin High School, Ella Franz, OCC Player of the Year, or year, sorry, Girls Tennis. <laughs> Jacob Moeller, OCC Player of the Year in Football and First Team All-State Division Two Football, Division Two Football in Absentia. Uh, Mia Reigns, 10th place state championship girls golf. Kyle Reinhardt, OCC Player of the Year, Boys Soccer. <laughs> Brogan Robinson, sixth place state championship, Boys Swimming, 200 yard medley and absentee. From Olentangy Liberty High School, Jamison Brooker, second team, All State Girls Soccer, also in absentee. Parker Cameron, second team, All-State Girls Volleyball. Okay. Logan Flau, second team, All-State Girls Volleyball. Aiden Geyer, seventh place, All-State 200-yard freestyle relay team, boys swimming. Did I, some, okay, that's all right. Christian Hostler, All-State, fifth place, 50-yard freestyle, and seventh place, 200-yard freestyle relay team. Did 
I miss it? Oh, sorry. She just corrected me on Parker on the All-State Volleyball. Sorry. Um, okay. Aiden Kinley, second team, All-State Football. Jackson Lazelli, fourth place, state championship, boys wrestling. Dylan Russo, state champion, boys wrestling in absentia. Daniel Shoney, girls tennis, also absent. Carter Smith, second team, all state football. Caden Springfield, second place, state championship diving. Lucas Uliano, All-State Boys Wrestling, fifth place. <laughs> Gavin Weiss, seventh place, All-State 200-yard freestyle relay, team boys swimming. Hudson Williams, seventh place, All-State 200-yard freestyle. Relay team, boys swimming, fourth place, 100-yard. Breaststroke, <laughs> this goes on and on and on. Uh, fourth place, 100-yard breaststroke, and second place, 200-yard individual medley. From Olentangy Orange High School, Sarah Borton, fifth place state championship, girls wrestling. Ala Kastin, fifth place, state championships, girls wrestling. London Davis, first team all, all Ohio, girls volleyball. Casey Homerodi, sixth place, championships, girls wrestling. Keegan Knapp, seventh place state championships, boys wrestling. Taryn Martin, state, state champion girls wrestling. Amanda Porba, OCC Player of the Year, Girls Soccer. Our student athletes are led by fantastic coaches and mentors. Many have received team and coaching honors this year from Olentangy High School. Join me in congratulating Coach uh, Keely Andriski. She led the cheer team to another state championship title. <laughs> Coach Earl Devani, also an absentee, led the uh, Olentangy High School girls soccer team as they claimed the titles of OCC champions, district champions, regional champions, finished this season as the 2020 state championship runner-up in girls soccer. Coach Devani was also honored as the OCC Coach of the Year. <laughs> Coach Calvin Higdon led the Olentangy High School girls swimming to a sixth place finish in the girls swimming state championships as a team and in the 400 yard freestyle freestyle relay. <laughs> coach Travis Widoff was chosen as the OCC Coach of the Year for Girls Volleyball. <laughs> From Olentangy Berlin High School, Jennifer Hedrick coached the Berlin High School gymnastics team to an OCC district championship in 2020. Unfortunately, Coach Hedrick was unable to be in attendance. Okay. 
<laughs> From Olentangy Liberty High School, we honor Coach Shayla Glover as OCC Coach of the Year, Liberty High School Girls Golf. OCC Coach of the Year Boys Soccer, Ricky Konkoskleski. And Ryan Snively, OCC Coach of the Year Boys Golf from Liberty High School. From Olentangy Orange High School, Rodney Palmer coached the, the Orange Boys Bowling Team to the OCC Championship. Coach Jared Ross led the Orange High School's boys golf team to the district championship in boys varsity golf. <laughs> Coach Scott Tressler, Ryan Nicola, and Vanessa Oswalt together coached the Orange High School girls wrestling team to a third place state finish. Coach Timothy Lawrence was at the helm of the Orange High School girls soccer and honored as the OCC Coach of the Year in the fall. And congratulations to all of the excellent coaches at our own Tangy schools. In the performing arts, our district is home to amazing musicians and the board is pleased to recognize a few of them this evening. We are proud of the vocalists and musicians earning state and national level honors over the past year. From Olentangy Orange High School, Colin Fogarty, excuse me, Colin Fogarty, 2020 National Association of Music Education, All National Honor Band. <laughs> Jeremy Arjono, member of the 2021 OMAA All State Choir, and member of the 2020 All-National Choir. <laughs> Michael Massioli, member of the 2020 All-National Choir. <laughs> okay, on behalf of the entire board, would like to again like would like to congratulate the many outstanding students, coaches, advisors recognized this evening. We are proud of your accomplishments and thank you for attending.
I have I have board president's report. Yeah. Um, okay, we're back to our agenda. Uh, that was great. We were able to recognize some of our athletes and our academic performing students and our our musical um, and fine arts students. So getting back kind of in the swing of things. Congratulations to all the students and the coaches that were recognized. For my board president's report, I have an update on the um, state budget. Um, the House's version passed. And what the House ended up doing is taking the fair funding formula and putting it into the budget. And so now the fair funding formula is part of House Bill 110, which the House passed, I think I told you all, 20, or 70 to 27. Uh, we appreciate the positive vote, the yes vote from Representative Carfagna. Unfortunately, Representative Jordan voted no for the state budget, which includes the fair funding formula, which impacts Olin Tangi and the other school districts in Delaware County. Um, what the fair funding formula will do is in the House's version, it actually gets implemented over a six year period. So in the first year of the phase in, the district would receive, if this passes the Senate and is signed by the governor, but if, um, if it goes as planned as it is now, we would receive an additional 3.5 million for fiscal year 22 and about 3.3 million for fiscal year 23. Now know that those numbers are based on the attendance numbers, the enrollment numbers today. So those would increase because the fair funding formula increases the number of students as, as your, the funding will increase as your student population increases. So that's positive. It also directly funds charter schools. So the charter school funding doesn't have to flow through the um, public schools anymore. Um, and it provides a fair way for all school districts to be funded. So now the battle is in the Senate and um, they've already started preliminary hearings in the Senate. I expect the Senate will vote the budget out uh, the last part of May or the first part of June. By law, it has to be signed into law by June 30th. Um, so we will keep you updated on that. And that is all that I have for my board president's report tonight. You made it back just in time, Mr. Ray. Well, I, some, somebody didn't like their picture because they apparently they had their mask on, so they asked me to come back and take a picture. I told them it didn't matter that you were there or not, so. You ran out. I did. Well, I thought we had to get back to the meeting. I was trying to just catch it, man. But that was very nice. It was just nice to see people um, just have people together and um, enjoyed that very much. So, um, So, um, excuse me, excuse me. We did have our is it still on screen there? It will be. So, um, as you're aware, last evening, the One Community Conference Series um, had its uh, uh, last, next event, there's one event still to follow. Um, this event featured uh, keynote speeches from uh, a number of our students. There was an application process that was posted to all four high schools. 20 students applied to speak. All the applicants received an audition in front of a panel of volunteers and administration staff. They used the rubric to score the auditions, and six high schoolers and one middle schooler were selected to present, and one high school student was chosen to MC the event. And um, 
they did an outstanding job, so we're very proud of the work of those students uh, and how well they represented themselves and their families uh, at the one community conference. Um, <clears throat> we're in the process of um, putting together our district-wide senior awards and scholarship night. Um, those are for seniors that are receiving district-wide awards and scholarships. It's a, uh, a virtual event that will be aired on May 3rd, beginning at 7 p.m. In addition, each high school will be um, doing a, an academic achievement recognition event for their seniors uh, later uh, in this month and into the month of May. Uh, those are, uh, unfortunately, again, virtual. The amount of planning and prep that go into it, the capacity restrictions and the size of our classes and the number of students earning those recognition uh, awards just um, makes it prohibitive to have those in person. So unfortunately, we are having to do this virtually. Um, I want to highlight probably you know, obviously one of the best programs we have in our district, and that's our DECA program. All four of our schools have students in the DECA program compete at the virtual, virtual Ohio DECA State Conference. Uh, there were many finalists in the top 10 in the state. Uh, many of those students qualified to participate in the virtual international career development conference this month. So I want to wish all of our DECA students still competing. And, you know, historically, we have we've always had uh, high placers in the state and national competition. So um, congratulations to all those students. I want to highlight our Orange uh, Middle School boys baseball team and honored their manager, Zach, with an official team jersey and embraced him as a player on the team. Uh, Coach Tom Cromley, he's a, an honest teacher at Orange Middle School, um, was featured on NBC4 uh, for their special relationship with Zach. So, especially proud of Coach Cromley, one of my former students from Liberty High. I always like to... <laughs> well, you know our basketball team? He coached basketball from here in here. Oh. 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 You have to... Oh, you have to see <laughs> You're right. And his mom is the secretary at Side of the Ridge. It's a great, great family. And so uh, a lot of action items I just want to highlight. Um, you know, this is always a special agenda because we are approving the seniors for graduation, obviously pending certification of all of their uh, state and local requirements. Um, so that is always great to see that long list of names. Um, I should know that number, but it is over 1,700. Um, that you're approving tonight. Uh, you'll be hearing a presentation on our district calendar and then uh, updates on the student handbook and the athletic handbooks that we'll be approving for next year. Um, there's a transaction for uh, natural gas uh, with Symmetry Energy Solutions. Uh, though this is only for the buildings that we are that are currently being serviced by Suburban Natural Gas. We will still be getting our, our gas from Suburban, a great local partner we have here. This is just a cost-saving measure, so again, compliments to Mr. Gordon and his crew for always uh, finding a way to save our district money. We have a contract with McHugh Construction for the renovation of the broadcast journalism room. Um, that was something we did in Orange High, and the, and the broadcast journalism program at Orange has certainly taken off, uh, and we expect the same from Liberty Burl and Old Angie um, once we have those spaces renovated. So that was part of the last bond package. We'll be doing that this summer. Uh, we have a resolution for the um, GMP amendment number two for Robertson for our playground and security vestibules. Um, we are um, going to put in bus lane improvements and a parking lot expansion at Hyatt's. Again, something that's part of the last bus package. Anybody who's ever experienced traffic at Hyatt's in the morning, this will be a welcome addition. We're going to kind of be putting in a fast pass lane for the buses. So all the parents doing drop off can be in a separate lane and the buses can get in and out of the building um, efficiently. Uh, it's been a problem point. It, it leads to um, late arrivals for our uh, elementary students in the morning, and, and when, when the middle school uh, dismissal is late, it also leads to late arrivals home for uh, elementary students in the evening. So this will rectify some of those, those problems. And then, um, uh, replacement computers uh, for the district as part of our normal replacement cycle, and then <clears throat> uh, interactive uh, panels and Chromebooks. Uh, again, uh, this is part of, as, as you know, over the years we've transitioned as technology continues to change. Back in the day, it was um, the projectors, 
and then we were using TVs as um, the devices that we were sharing computers on. And now when we built Berlin, the technology was, was advanced um, to have uh, interactive uh, touch screens. So we're just continuing that upgrade process um, to provide equity throughout the district. And then lastly, our important dates, we have um, conference exchange day coming up that is obviously part of our calendar. The uh, Senior Awards and Scholarship Night, um, Portrait Level Learner, the next topic is Curious Learners, and that will be May 5th, so I encourage everyone to tune into that. Our final event for the One Community Conference is May 8th, and, um, and then our next board meeting is May 20th, so there's a little bit of some time. We only have one board meeting in May, uh, as we traditionally do with, um, with graduations the other time we're together. So with that, any questions? Any questions for Mr. Ray? Thank you. Nope. Thank you. Next, we have our treasurer's report. This is Hatfield.
roughly one point four million dollars that would have been spent. And that's all we get. And that's all we get. Um, the rest of our expenditures that we are experiencing from COVID are being paid out of the general fund. We are not eligible for ESSER two or ESSER three, the um, latest round of federal funding. So we will be taking on the rest of those expenditures through the general fund process, and we'll get more into some of those expenses through the forecast presentation. Um, for our donations, we have a $10,000 uh, purchase guided reading collections from Tyler Run PTL, $1,500 to the Olentangy High School Band from an anonymous donor, $2,000 to the Olentangy High School Environmental Club from the Columbus Zoological Park Association, and just over $5,700 for supplemental coaching from the Olentangy Athletic Boosters to OHS. So we're very grateful for all of those donations. Um, we know a lot of folks are putting, still putting in their time and donating in kind, even though we are not having periods in the buildings at this time. They still continue to support our kids at home and um, help support the teachers throughout. So we're very grateful and we thank you for that. The Meta Service Agreement is an annual service agreement that we bring forward. Um, with Meta, they provide our um, student information system, so access to PowerSchool. This is where the student data is kept as well as grades and other information. So parents have access to their grades, they have access to pay online fees, et cetera, through that program. It also gives us access to IEP Anywhere, which is a testing system that we can use for special, special education students, excuse me, as well as infant campus um, and access to purchasing co-op memberships. So it's a very um, robust service agreement that we are approving tonight, um, but the people want to continue to have benefit from. Are there any questions I can answer for you regarding those items? Oh, can, can I? Sure. <coughs> What's that? Go ahead. I was uh, just doing this. Five-year forecast? Yes. So with only one meeting in May, we'll be able to get to a first reading, second reading, and get it submitted on time? Yes, we have to submit it to the Ohio Department of Education by the end of the end of May. Um, we will do the first reading tonight. Final approval will be presented May 20th, and that oh. will give us 10 days to submit it to the Ohio Department of Education on time. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We'll see you here in a couple minutes. Next, we have our public participation. And just as a reminder, um, we have our, our communications person, Krista, is reading them from the emails that are submitted. These are not Krista's thoughts. Um, Krista reads them in the order that they were received. And each submission has five minutes. And Krista reads through them. Mrs. Hatfield keeps the time. So each submission has five minutes and Mrs. Hatfield will let Krista know if she goes over that time. And then the total time for public participation is 30 minutes. Did I miss anything? Okay, Krista, take it away. All right. Our first submission is from Kelly Piles, 752 Windstone Drive, Lewis Center. It's about time that the school board and the superintendent start listening to the kids of this district. The seniors are asking for a traditional graduation and they deserve that. The district has failed to protect several kids throughout the years from a vice principal that bullied kids to staff that have discriminated against students based on race, size, and financial background, to name a few. It's time for you to get something right and to do the right thing. Next is from Carolyn and Roger Glenn, 533 Glen Road, Delaware, Ohio. <clears throat> My name is Carolyn Gardner Glenn. I'm writing to uphold the mascot of the Olentangy High School, the Brave. Someone to be revered as strong, courageous, and admired. Our family history in the Olentangy School District is extensive. I was born in the little village of Powell and lived in the house in which I was born until I married my Olentangy High School sweetheart. My brother graduated from OHS in 1964. My husband and I both proudly graduated in 1962. 
Our son graduated in 1989 and our daughter in 1992. Our two grandsons are Olentangy students, one a sophomore at Berlin High School and the other a fourth grader at Cheshire Elementary. Our family has paid taxes to the Olentangy School District for all 67 years it has existed, and now we feel betrayed. There are so many families just like ours who have lived here a lifetime, and now we are being told that what we have admired and loved about our school system is suddenly racist. As taxpayers, we believe we should have been given more information about what was happening. We do not spend our working hours on social media. We have a business to run. We rely on the written information that can be digested from mailings and newspapers. The district is progressing without the input from a large segment of this community. Most of the information comes to us after the fact. It sounds like a major makeover of the entire school district, new logos, new mascots, new curriculum, new training for teachers, staff, and administration. Even elected school board members need new training. I taught for Big Walnut Schools in the 60s and 70s, and I quickly learned how important it was to know the community. A questionnaire sent to every resident would have been a token of appreciation to all the taxpayers who put the bill. They should have had an opportunity to voice their thoughts on important issues and changes in their school system. Since the Olentangy School District receives so little funding from the state of Ohio, it must be provided by the taxpayers. When it comes time for operating levies and bond issues, we always receive mailings promoting them. The drastic change is now being undertaken, it would have been wise to inform the people who will provide much of the funding. Finally, the Braves are those who have a special place in the history of the school district. Our family is proud to be the home, home of the Braves. After all, even our national anthem has a special reference to the character of Braves. Next is from Jacob Bonacci, 286 Bluff Ridge Court. Please re reconsider having a traditional graduation, such as having it at our own football stadiums instead of a boring drive through Next, Samantha Stewart, 1051 Las Vegas Boulevard, Columbus, Ohio. I would like any and all team names or mascots that are related to Native American tribes to be immediately discontinued. There is a historic and current racist epistemology to the Braves name. It does not honor anyone. It only perpetuates gross misrepresentations and causes harm. Discontinuing the name is a step toward growth and healing for everyone in the community. I can't just that <laughs> um, Next is Jennifer Hoyt, 2231 Tucker Trail, Lewis Center. I am concerned and disappointed that OLSD in partnership with the Delaware County Health Department failed to work alongside concerned parents and to reschedule the high school COVID vaccine clinics. The district and health department instead moved forward with the 9 a.m. to 12 noon clinics at our high school buildings instead of taking into consideration an after school hours option. <laughs> clinics have been held during and after school hours in the past. However, our concern is due to the controversial nature of the COVID vaccine. COVID vaccine is not FDA approved like the seasonal flu shot. The COVID vaccine is simply authorized for emergency use. For this very reason, there are very strong feelings surrounding the use of this vaccine on youth who also happen to be the least impacted by this virus. Holding clinics during school hours does nothing to protect the privacy of those students wishing to decline the vaccine. They are subject to judgment by their peers and teachers that may view them as not doing their part to stop the spread. The teacher's vaccine clinic was held after hours and I had requested that this clinic extend that same level of privacy to our students. The clinics are in violation of code of conduct rules of the district handbook referring to rule number one and the disruption of the regular school day and other rules which refer to hostile school environment and intimidation. I also asked how adverse reactions would be handled on school grounds after the county nurses had left campus and the health department's response was, quote, our EMS team has really good response times, end quote, and could handle a severe reaction. There was nothing shared regarding how teachers might have to deal with multiple students feeling ill after receiving their shot. Our school, school buildings are a place for education to serve our students during school hours. Though I appreciate the efforts by our health district to offer convenience to our families, our buildings are not health and wellness centers during school hours, and a true effort should have been made by district officials and the health department to offer these clinics after school hours. Next, Karina Turner, 265 Tara Glenn Drive, Delaware. Hello board, once again, I am asking for a meeting with you all to discuss the Braves name again. 
I would actually prefer to have a community forum to discuss this and would appreciate your support in that. A real discussion, not just back and forth on social media. So much is lost in those conversations. For today, I'm going to address concerns we've seen on social media. I want to remind the community that the board is removing the native imagery and giving the name Braves another meaning and mascot of which they have not shared with me or anyone I know. Questions asked from the community via social media, parentheses, full disclosure, these questions are not the exact wording of the questions, but the premise of the question is there. End parentheses. One, question, have you talked with actual Native Americans about this? Answer, yes. For this endeavor, I spoke with Native Americans who identify as Native American and are culturally Native American, leaders who have a vested interest in their people the chief of the Eastern Shawnee tribe, the cultural director of the Delaware tribe, who both gave us letters for the board, the National Congress of American Indians and Coalition of Natives and Allies sent a letter as well. I continue to see, seek out new voices to add to the conversation. See these communications on our Facebook page, Retire the Braves. Number two, question, is the Braves name really a slur? Answer, for some people, yes, for other, no. It is a linguistic study of different tribal interpretations, but the name itself isn't really the main issue. It is the cultural stereotyping at sports events that occurs that is the issue. Face painting, donning a headdress, tomahawk chops, opposing team yelling, scalp them, etc. Number three, question. Why are we so offended by everything now? Answer, concerns around native mascots and names is not a new woke movement. This has been an issue since the 1960s. Number four, question, is this a big deal? Answer, I would pose that question to yourself. If you ask the question, is it a big deal? Then you have your answer. If it's not a big deal, then let us move on from the name Braves and choose something else. Five, question, why do you want to erase Native Americans from our community? Answer, this is quite the opposite. If the only thing that represents Native Americans is the name Braves, then we have failed. Our intention is to include more Native American education. At Berlin High School, we have done just that. During the fall, we had a display of celebrations. One of those we highlighted was the Hopi Soil Solstice Ceremony. We discussed this religious ceremony. The purpose is the Kiva and the Hopi Kachina dolls. This information was done with the help of a Hopi artisan from New Mexico. Currently at Berlin, there is a display on the healing Ojibwe jingle dress and discussion around missing and murder, murdered indigenous women. Again, done with the help of Navajo dying people from Utah. Our goal is to increase exposure, not diminish. A future goal would be field trips to the Hopewell Indian Mounds and other fun activities for the kids. Six, question, I am Native American and don't care about the name. Answer, great, we would love to talk with you. We just hope that your claim to be Native American is a true statement and not a familial folklore or a positive DNA test. Regardless of where the decision lands, we would love to partner moving forward with any Native Americans in our district. We acknowledge Native Americans are not a monolith. Opinions will not be 100% the same. For an example, let's address the University of Utah. They are called the Utes. Their mascot is a red-tailed hawk. One per, minute. Per the agreement with the Utes tribe, every freshman takes local Native American history. There is Native representation on boards, in the classroom, and campaigns to help Native youth attend the university on scholarship. I grew up going to their annual powwow. The culture is rich and abundant and approved by, and unfortunately this is cut off. I apologize, Karina. Um, Stephanie Fickleman, 518 Creekstone Drive. I would like to propose that you remove the mask mandates for outdoor recess and gym class. If our indoor and outdoor athletes do not need to be masked for physical activity, I don't think the elementary schools should require it either. Next, Heather Primavera, 1196 Caribou Run, Delaware. Hello, I have been happy to hear the return to full time has gone well, and I'm thankful my children are back five days a week. I am, however, becoming more and more concerned with the masking of the children. I realize that to an extent, you don't have to, you don't have a say in this. However, if I am reading things correctly, you could allow for certain things. No masks outside where there has been virtually no evidence of spread in the world outdoors, honoring all exemptions, etc. And also, you can ask questions and pursue discussion in regards to this with the health department. 
This may already be happening, and if so, thank you. I just wanted to voice my concern that many scientific studies have shown that A, these children are not effective spreaders, and B, masks may not be effective in stopping the spread. I would be happy to send these studies in a separate email to the board. I hear from some people, quote, who cares, it's just a mask, end quote. But it's not just a mask for some. I believe the unintended consequences are being ignored. All I ask is that the board look into the possibility that they are causing more harm physically, emotionally, psychologically, developmentally, socially, than the potential good. Hopefully these discussions are already being had with the health department. Some of the stories I have heard regarding the children and masks are honestly breaking my heart, and so I feel compelled to ask you to look into this. Hopefully soon, masking the children will be a choice made personally with the parents and perhaps in consultation with their personal doctor. In the meantime, I hope you will consider letting the children play outside during recess without masks as they do in many other schools. And I hope you will pursue discussion in regards to the harms and long-term effects the masks may have on these children. Thank you for hearing my concerns. Next is from Tracy Kersey, 2793 Colts Bridge Drive, Lewis Center. The actions taken by the school district and health department are not based on science or stats. The whole pandemic has been politicized. I don't know who continues to believe these actions are helpful to anyone, but they are being extremely dishonest and or they are ill-informed. If mask policies for Olentangy schools are not voluntary for children come fall, I do believe the district will have a huge fight on their hands. Facts and science matter and neither are being followed. If you just go on the CDC website, you can find a chart comparing a surgical mask, most people are wearing cloth, so there's that, and then 95 masks. The intended use and purpose is, quote, fluid resistant and provides the wearer protection against large droplets, splashes, or sprays of bodily or other hazardous fluids. Protects the patient from the wearer's respiratory emissions, end quote. These do not prevent transmission of aerosol or viral particles. N95 masks were intended for the use around patients with tuberculosis, et cetera, which is a bacterial infection, and the particles are much larger than a COVID or influenza virus particle which suddenly has been miraculously eradicated. I encourage you to fight for the truth and the health of our kids in this district. Shut down the fear mongering of parents and teachers in our district with facts on viruses and masks. I think a presentation from experts such as Stephen Petty, local national exposure PPE expert would be extremely valuable to staff. Stephen Petty did an interview with Dr. Douglas Franks in March, 2021 in regards to the work he did with Oakstone Academy here in Ohio. Oakstone Academy has been in person with no masks since last summer. Where there's a will, there's a way. According to Stephen Petty, quote, number one, PPE are the least desirable way to protect people. Two, masks are not PPE. Three, scientific evidence suggests COVID-19 particles are mostly small aerosols, not droplets, which would mean respirators, not masks, are needed to protect the lungs and would make the six foot rule effectively meaningless. And number four, smaller particles are likely a greater cause of disease since they can reach deep into the lungs, end quote. The size of a COVID viral particle is 0.1 to 0.3 microns, and because of their extremely small size and density, they can stay suspended in the air for a very long time, seven to 50 days. Also, another great video is Masks, colon, The Science and Myths by Dr. Lee Merritt. Quote, children do not readily acquire SARS COVID-2, very low risk, spread it to other children or teachers or endanger parents or others at home, end quote. And that is from Masking Children, Tragic, Unscientific, and Damaging from www.aier.org. In Ohio, according to the COVID-19 mortality metrics, there have been seven deaths, 0.00037% of Ohio COVID deaths under the age of 19 and 31 deaths, 0.0016% of Ohio COVID deaths under the age of 29. One minute. Teachers are also not a significant risk of dying of COVID. If you look at the number of deaths under the age 60 in the state of Ohio, which would likely be the majority of people in the school, it makes up for 7% of COVID deaths, 1,364 deaths. For reference, Ohio has a little over 11.6 million people. I won't even get started on the accuracy of these numbers and the PCR tests. 
Also, we only have 20 active student cases and three active staff cases. Active cases include confirmed cases, probable cases, and suspect cases. So why are schools locked down? Why is there plexiglass everywhere? Why are kids wearing masks? Why are events for our children being canceled? Why is there social distancing? And why are the high schools having vaccine clinics for an experimental drug trial? It's really unbelievable and sad. In conclusion, I believe the governor and his administration believe that encouraging and mandating mask wearing would help curb the fear of the pandemic in Ohio. Unfortunately, it has created more fear and harm. I hope you all consider this information as you plan for next year. Our children deserve better. And that note. Thank you. Thank you. Again, these will be scanned in and placed on the website and they are placed um, right where we put all of our um, board materials. And uh, the one that was cut off will be in its entirety on the website. Thank you. Okay, discussion items. We have the district calendar. Mr. Wright, what do you have for us? An Good unveiling? evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for your patience as we gathered feedback from our community. Uh, we did shut that down at the end of school day last Monday. We had 952 responses. Of those 952 responses, uh, I think we found consistent inconsistencies um, throughout. Uh, I read through every comment, shared comments with our leadership team, with uh, OTA President Elaine Netty, and we reviewed it. Um, of the 952 pieces of feedback, there, there basically was rolling contradictions, uh, a comment of I like winter break being this way was immediately followed by I don't like winter break being this way and it applied to everything on our calendar so uh, as many people as liked what we offered in both calendars disliked what we um, presented both calendars there was no significant indication to make any changes um, so with that the calendar that we are presenting for your approval is the model that has been our traditional calendar for the past four years uh, or draft a that was presented to the public so that is what we are presenting and wanted to see if you had any questions on that questions okay thank you very much thank you next we have jack betty to do our student and athletic handbooks and this is an mm -hmm. annual event this is an annual event each year. We ask the board to approve the next year's student handbooks. So you have in your information handbooks for elementary, middle, and high school, as well as our athletic programs and preschool. Um, there are very few changes to the handbooks this year. We did a pretty significant overhaul two years ago. So there's all technical corrections um, and some minor changes in technology. Um, you'll also notice that the preschool handbook is not redlined because we totally revamped the format of it to make it align uh, with our elementary um, handbooks. Did you have any questions on it? <laughs> any questions? I, I do. I was trying to see the difference in the technology mm -hmm. section, and it looked similar, so am I, it, there's a lot mm -hmm. of verbiage there. So There is, and most of the verbiage is the same. Um, some of okay. it was reordered, and okay. some of it was updated by our uh, Sam Marshall, our security supervisor, to uh, accurately reflect our uh, user agreements. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Next, we have the first reading of our five year forecast. As Ms. Patfield makes her way up, I just want to say that um, Dave King and I participated in the Finance and Audit Committee meeting that we held earlier this month. Um, and the committee reviewed the, at, at that time. Um, yes, yeah, so to um, Mrs. Beasel's point, we did meet with the Finance and Audit Committee. We met with a sub portion of that committee to look at the budgets in detail and then also as a large group to look at the five-year forecast and as a compilation, um, both of which had very minor suggestions uh, to the five-year forecast. We had some notation uh, requests and revisions, but 
nothing material to the actual assumptions within the forecast. We always want to start out with the purpose and objectives and methodologies for the five-year forecast. Again, the purpose is to engage the Board of Education and community in our long-range financial um, planning. It helps us sign our certificates required by ORC, which is considered a 412 certificate that says that we can pay for the items that we are approving for expenditures. And it provides a methodology for the Ohio Department of Education and Ohio, Ohio Auditor of State to identify districts with potential financial problems. We also want to discuss methodology. Um, I think it's important to remember that while this forecast is our best assumptions at the time that it is put together, they are assumptions. We have historical information in an almost um, complete fiscal year. We are actual through March. So we do have three months remaining. Um, and then from those, from FY22 going forward, we are using the methodology of estimation to come up with the remainder of the forecast. So it is a living, breathing document and continues to change as actual information continues to change. So let's start by taking a look at our fall summary. Um, we found this description or this table is helpful for the community and for the Board of Education to get the important lines of the forecast. So we have our total revenue, total expenditures, our revenue versus expenditures, explaining how fast we are spending um, the revenue that we have coming in. A negative number there means that we are spending more than we are bringing in in revenue. We have our unreserved fund balance, which is of course in the millions. Um, and because that number is such a large number in general, we want to make sure that we add context to that and provide days cash on hand. So for example, in FY21, while we have $87.9 million, what that means for the district is we can operate for 120 days and pay our bills. So we want to put that context with those unreserved cash balances because they are large when you're just reading it um, from the general community's perspective. So our estimates in the fall had us um, ending this fiscal year with 120 days of cash on hand and ending FY25 the last of the five-year forecast with 18 days on hand. So let's take a look at the updates for the revenue and what has changed. So we have three major components that we want to discuss, uh, some of which we talked about with the March uh, board financials, but just to reiterate, we have $1.2 million over our expectations for public utility personal property, or PUP, this is due to valuation increases of our utilities in the area. Um, we believe a lot of that is coming from the AEP substation and the changes that they have done to increase that, but also just the other public utility um, valuations in the, in the district's area. Our unrestricted grants and aid, we discussed the governor's executive order. Um, we million dollars to the good and then our other operating revenue is about four million dollars ahead of expectations due to our players to tip coming online and being active let's take a look at our expenditure updates and what has changed from our november forecast um, we are about 1.3 million dollars under and personnel services, so this is our salary line. We have classified substitutes and field trip wages that are under budget in our personnel services. Um, our insurance benefits are under by about 1.2 million. Part of that is just simply reflecting the personnel services um, under budget because retirement is a percentage of those wages. And then additionally, looking at our insurance enrollment trend, um, we continue to see our new hires and staff 
participate in a high deductible plan versus our traditional medical PPO plan, which is a um, reduced cost for the district as well as those individuals. So the HSA um, money that we are contributing is helping people select that plan. And I think their staff is, is finding it to be a good benefit to them by allowing them to save a premium cost if they're not utilizing um, a high claims package. Purchase services. Um, this is where we have our substitute teachers. Um, so we are under budget about $1.7 million. Um, substitute teachers, meetings and mileage, and alternative transportation um, are reduced with not only COVID-19 because some of those services have not been provided, but we did increase our substitute teacher expectation in November, assuming that we would have additional subs that needed to be placed in the building to help with all of our procedures and, and helping the students through the building, not to mention staff absences. So that, um, that estimation is, is being reduced. And then operating, or excuse me, other objects are operating transfers out. Um, we have taken a look at the food service department. Um, as you may remember from last fiscal year, we made a $1.5 million board approved transfer into the food service fund. Um, because we were closed the last, uh, from March through the end of the school year, they needed support to be a solvent fund when we closed the books. Uh, we originally had the 1.5 um, estimation in November to do that again at the end of this fiscal year. We have increased that by $2 million, um, thinking that we will have to make a greater contribution to that and potentially our athletic funds as well, as they had closures um, and were not able to have their gate receipts come in at previous expectations. Um, we will continue to monitor this though. Again, this is an estimation. I know that we have another couple of months of actual costs that we are going to watch for that fund balance. And we will bring that forward in June for the board's approval with the uh, better estimated costs. So we'll continue to watch that trend. So let's take a look at the spring forecast results in the same way that we looked at the November results. Again, just putting the highlights of the forecast into a table so a little bit easier to digest. Um, as you can see, we are positive. We have a positive um, expenditures versus revenue in fiscal year 21 and 22, where previously we had a negative amount in 2021. We thought we would outspend our revenues. So the changes that we are seeing in the additional revenue and the reduced expenditures are helping us get to a positive um, revenue versus expenditure in 2021, which is fantastic. That will continue in fiscal year 2022. Um, when the 2020 operating levy, levy excuse me, was passed. It allowed for half a year collection of the new revenue in fiscal year 21, and we'll have a full year in fiscal year 2022, which is helping us gain momentum in fiscal year 22. We will have Shale Meadows coming online. Oh. God bless you. In fiscal 22, um, we have taken elementary 17 and study when we needed that second elementary to come online after reviewing enrollment projections and taking a look at when we would need that um, we have actually pushed that out in the five-year forecast to fiscal year 2025. so again just to reiterate from the bond package we have fiscal year 2022 will open shale meadows in fiscal year 2024, we will see our sixth middle school come online. And in fiscal year 2025, we will have our second new elementary come online. And those two pieces are um, the new middle school and new elementary school 
are lending to that negative revenue versus expenditure in those two years. That's why you see kind of a big jump there. However, in putting the unreserved cash balance in, day, in terms of days of cash on hand, we are estimating in this fiscal year 134 days, and in 2025 be at about 65 days cash on hand. Um, so we, again, we will be able to meet our three-year levy campaign promise and hope to extend it for um, years or more. Um, we still have some risk associated in the forecast, which we need to discuss to make sure that we're addressing items that can change these numbers. Um, we need to talk about our enrollment. As we know, we are an ever-growing district. Um, traditionally, we have about five to 600 new students every year. Um, we have had slower enrollment growth this fiscal year as our kindergarten and preschool student enrollment has not been as significant as it has in the past. I won't say that it's, it, um, it didn't grow, it just didn't grow as fast as we have seen it in the past. So that slower growth is helping us take that second elementary and delay it a year. What's unknown is how will that be reflected in the next academic year? Will those enrollments increase to previous growth measures? Or will they slow down and take a two year to three year period to come back? Um, those are some of the things that we just don't know. We have to wait and see. So we will continue to study enrollment in the fall with actual enrollment and new enrollment projections um, to help us determine how that will impact us going forward. Real estate valuations always play a significant part to our five-year forecast. Um, I was kind of excited to hear a community member mention that we just don't get enough state funding and we're locally funded. Um, not that I like that situation, but it's awesome that that message is understood and is in the community. Um, so real estate valuations really can have an impact on our revenue stream and how it goes forward. Reappraisal delays, delinquency collections, board of revision cases, um, and potential decline in class two valuations are of concern. We have had legislation that is changing the board of revision process. Um, now companies or um, class two or commercial properties can challenge their valuation after that January 1 date. Um, so that causes a problem in that they might be able to change it mid-year and it can change, adjust our valuation tools in, in intermittently, excuse me. Um, and then the decline of class two valuations. We really don't know how COVID will impact those commercial properties within our district and if it will cause a decline in value as some of those um, issues in the economy continue to play out. State funding and legislation changes are also amongst the risk section. Um, we have a state biennium budget. It is approved every two years. And as Mrs. Fiesel talked about, we're currently in the process of having a new state budget come through the legislative function. Um, the Fair School Funding Plan is a plan that will help increase the funding or change the funding structure for every school in the state of Ohio um, to a more understandable and economic way that the community will know and it will grow with the number of students. For a district like Olin Kanji, what that means is as we continue to get bigger, we will continue to receive more funding for our students versus being capped. The current formula caps us and keeps us from getting about $43 million in funding from the state. So we would like to see that removed. It's also important to note that the Fair School Funding Plan funds students where they're registered to go to school. So we would no longer receive deductions for our charter non public schools or for um, other scholarship opportunities. What's happening is we are receiving about just under $500 per pupil. When a student leaves and receives that scholarship, they are getting about $6,000 to go to another school. 
the difference in that funding is coming out of our local property tax valuation collections. And so funding the students where they go will help take that burden out of our local collections and just fund the students where they are. A much more um, fair way to fund students and a much more fair and transparent way to show where that funding is going. Um, so I would encourage our listeners to please take a look and follow along with the state budget. Um, as Mrs. Fiesel mentioned, it is through the House with the Fair School Funding Plan mostly intact. The only things that have changed have been minor revisions to component parts. Um, but it enlarged it House Bill 1, which mirrored House Bill 305, the original introduction of the Fair School Funding Plan, is folded into their budget. It's having a hard time in the Senate. Um, at this time, there's not a lot of Senate support, so we encourage our community to follow and watch the Senate process and reach out to our senators um, with their concerns. Um, and then almost finally, our association agreements. We are fortunate we have a really good relationship with our four unions. Um, but it does impact insurance costs and enrollment as those are negotiated items as well as wages. So we continue to have those conversations and keep those relationships in great order, but they do have um, an impact on the fiber forecast should those change. And then ESCCO contracted service is the final item that I would mention. Um, we do contract with the ESCCO for all of our preschool and special education teaching. And so as that program begins, continues to grow, not begins, but continues to grow, um, this particular contract and paid service continues to grow with it. Um, it is one of the largest components of the other expenditure line. And so it really is, it's kind of, it's pretty visible when we do experience growth there. Um, the other line item that is large in that component is just our real estate collection fees that we have to pay because even with collecting taxes, we have to pay the county auditor to collect and distribute those funds to us. It was a lot of information to digest. What questions can I answer for you? Questions? I have a question regarding the food services. Sure. Um, will we be continuing those um, after this school year? When the school year ends, is that when that the um, the free lunch and breakfast for all students? Like, when does that end? Great question. So that is considered the seamless summer option is the name of the program, um, and we are not considering using that through the summer and into 2022. So we are anticipating that that to end at the end of this um, cap or academic year, excuse me. The reason that we participated in that program for this academic year was that the federal funding per meal served is higher per unit if we participated in this program. And so it was a way for us to help um, bring in more revenue, even though we only had half the number of students in the buildings through the hybrid model to generate revenue from the a la carte and additional purchases. So that was one of the reasons why we participated in that program, um, but it will not continue past this academic year. Did we have to participate in the program to provide free meals for all of our students? We did. It was an option to participate. The program does generate though the free meals for all students. So it takes away the need to have a, um, for parents to mark free and reduced um, information on their application. They can apply for free and reduced meals, but then they can also check the box to share that information and it impacts other fees. Um, because this free and reduced meal program, the summer program is in effect, they didn't have to do that. But because we did it, we have kids who are getting free meals that don't necessarily need to have free meals, correct? Correct, but the funding per meal helps us recover some of the lost revenue that we had by not having kids in session five days a week, all, 
all the students. So had we not participated in the program, we would have been reimbursed in the same amount, but would we have lost the same amount of money? Would we have had to reimburse the, the food services like more or less or? So had we not participated with the, 50, with the hybrid model, mm -hmm. we probably would have a larger gap or more funding that we would need to help support the food service fund with because they're not having that the, they're not getting the additional difference in funding from not participating versus participating. Um, if it, we had uh, our students in full all day, five day a week, every day, it might not have been necessary for us to do it to gain as much as we could, but with the hybrid model, it made the most sense. <clears throat> and you know, Am I that well? I mean, and Bethany's going to, Mrs. Lenko does an annual food service update. I think she can go into a lot more depth and detail. Depth and detail on, not that you're not, I think you're doing a good job explaining it, but, but we'll make sure to include that because she's on the docket to give that update. Okay. And so I'd like to be able to pay the general fund back at some point. And so I think that we need to look at a policy of, you know, you take an extra per, like once the food services budget starts earning money and they have like a 60 day buffer in there and anything like above a 60 day buffer would go toward paying the general fund back because that's supposed to be used for education. Right. And we can, we certainly can do that. We're in conversations about that now. Um, we had a meeting with Mr. Meyer and Mrs. Linko and Mr. Gordon about that. Um, what made the most sense? How could we do this to ensure that we that they are able to operate in the black but still pay back um, those funds over time? So one of the driving factors of that will be that final remaining portion that they may need this fiscal year because I think that gap will help us determine okay what is that percentage? What makes sense? How fast can we pay this back, etc. Um, so we're definitely looking into that and have an idea on the table. It's definitely an expectation that we will do so. Um, we'll have more details as we get closer to the end of the fiscal year and have a truer number to work with. And then just so people have like a, this number in their mind, what is our, our total spend per day? Like what, what is, what are we expensing on sure. a daily basis? I'm food or in general? No, I'm sorry. For the, general, the general, fund. general fund? Yeah. Sure. So for the general fund, we are spending this year about $721,000 a day. Rounded. Okay. Yeah. I like having that 60, you know, the days cash on hand. I think it, it helps people visualize that. Um, so I, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Gives perspective. And I believe in the, yeah. in the notes um, of the draft forecast that you have in your packet, we also added that expenditure per day amount as an additional um, metric to the forecast template itself. So that will also, if you like that, I, I know that's helpful. We can make sure we leave that in the final draft for your approval in May. Yep, I do. Yeah, okay. Any questions? Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. We'll let you get back to your seat before you do, mm -hmm. uh, because you have some um, treasure action items to present to us. Mm -hmm. I would like to present um, treasure action items A through E for approval, please. Do I have a motion on A through E in the treasure action items? I'll move. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, Mrs. Patrick seconds. Thank you. Any further discussion? Call the roll, please. Mr. King? Yes. Mrs. Patrick? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Dr. Weiss? Yes. And Mrs. Wagner Fiesel? Yes. Thank Superintendent you. action items, what do you have for us tonight? Yes, ma'am, I'd like to present Superintendent action items A through L for approval. Do I have a motion to approve A through L? So moved. Dr. Weiss, do I have a second? I'll second. Mrs. Patrick? Thank you. Any further discussion on those items? 
Call the roll, please. Dr. White? Yes. Mrs. Patrick? Yes. Mr. King? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. And Mrs. Wagner-Fiesel? Yes. Thank now you. I, I need a motion and a second um, to go into executive session as permitted by section 121.22G1 of the Ohio Revised Code to consider the employment of public employees. So, oh, I'll second. Okay. Mr. O'Brien and Mrs. Patrick. Um, when we come out, we will not be taking any further action. We will just come out to adjourn. I think we're going into the nonfiction room. Our next meeting is um, May 20th. <laughs> And um, we'll be back to a Fiction would be more appropriate. Executive <laughs> <laughs> session. Mr. O'Brien. Yes. Mrs. Patrick. Yes. Mr. King. Yes. Dr. White. Yes. And Mrs. Wagner Fiesel. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I now need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, uh, all those in favor? Aye. All five. All yes. five eyes. Okay. <laughs> so we're adjourning at 9:47. All right.